This is Adrian Warnock's Christian Podcast. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to this uh, interview. My name is Richard Johnston and I'm the guest interviewer with Adrian Warnock, the well-known vlogger and blogger. So I'm turning the tables on Adrian in this interview and we're going to explore a little bit of his journey over recent years and I'm really looking forward to what he's going to share with us. So Welcome to your own interview, Adrian. <laughs> yes, thanks. It does feel a bit odd, actually. It's a bit like, um, you know, uh, poacher turned gamekeeper or something. That's right. That, I'll be quite gentle with you. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. No, no Jeremy Paxman, all right? No, absolutely not. No, the, no Rottweiler interviews here. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... Tell me a little bit about yourself, Adrian, initially, and how you came to faith, and it's just something of your own journey uh, from early years and up till now. Sure. So um, I come from a sort of long line of Christians, really, um, and um, interesting because I know you're you're a Scottish guy. So uh, Warnock's actually a Scottish surname. Um, and growing up, three out of my four grandparents spoke with a similar accent to yours, Richard. So I always feel uh, very at home when I'm speaking to Scottish people. Uh, like, you know, on the, on the, if, I, if I get a call centre ring me up and it's someone Scottish, then I'm afraid I'm a mug for that. You know, yeah, I'll, I'll buy whatever you want. It's no problem. Because um, obviously that's quite deep within me. Uh, and little things. So uh, in terms of that sort of Scottishness, um, little funny things like um, growing up, I always used to talk about the heel of bread. I mean, you know what the heel of a loaf of bread is? I understand that's a sort of Scottish yeah. phrase, um, but it's not an English phrase. And I, but I didn't know that because both my parents had those Scottish roots. So my mum was actually born in Aberdeen of, of Scottish parents uh, and then oh, moved yeah. down. Uh, but my father, it was his father that was the Warnock. Uh, he was actually a tent preacher um, in uh, the, the sort of um, borders area. He lived in Rutherglen, but he travelled around with a tent evangelising all the villages up there before realizing that, you know, that the pagan South uh, really needed to hear the gospel. So he, he felt right. the call of God to, to come down. He joined something called the Counties of Angeles, which uh, still exists today, uh, and would take a tent around uh, mostly um, Suffolk, but also other, other places as well, um, preaching the gospel uh, in, in areas. Uh, he met an English, actually a Londoner, funnily enough, because I live, I live in London now on the edge of London. He met a Londoner who was a nurse, um, so she was the only one of my four grandparents who was uh, actually um, not Scottish. And, and they met as he was pushing up the tent and uh, she saw him. She was cycling by and uh, she was like, what's, what's this handsome young man doing? I mean, you know, this, the Warnock, uh, you know, the Warnock good looks. <laughs> and um, she came along to his meeting and, um, and that night she, she gave her heart to the Lord. Um, and so... You know, they lived a life of faith, um, not always with lots of money, but um, God provided for them. Um, and so as a result of that, both my parents were from that sort of stock. It was kind of brethren stock, really. Um, uh, for those that remember the brethren, I know they're still around a little bit, although many of those churches now would just call themselves evangelical churches. Yeah. Um, and, um, and of course, the brethren really... I I've always had this view of church history that God uses different movements to bring things back. And I guess the thing that God brought back through the Brethren ministry was, was body ministry. So the sense that it doesn't just have to be the pastor, that actually yeah. we are a body. And so they would have these meetings where people could stand up and share what they felt the Lord was putting on their heart. Um, they wouldn't have called it prophecy. And it might well have been something inspired by a particular Bible verse that they'd shared. But they'd have those moments where they were waiting for the spirit to move and, and the congregation as a whole would speak and and they would always have a team of elders um, before the brethren. Many churches would be led by one pastor. And, and that's less common now, really, directly because of the brethren. So that was the, uh, the background that I came. Um, and of course, there was a sense of the spirit leading them. I mean, uh, you know, my, my grandfather would talk about wanting to be led of the spirit to where he wanted them to go and preach um, and the spirit miraculously providing for them. So, you know baskets of food appearing on their doorstep when when they had no money to buy food and living by faith and, and very much I suppose like the missionaries those kinds of things so that was my background 
um, until my in parents your, uh, got in your um, formative to years. Sorry? In your formative years, did you actually grow up in the Brethren? Or, um... Yeah, so no. So, so basically, I was about four, something like that, five. And, um, um, and my parents moved from a village to a town. And they moved to a town called Haywards Heath. And they tried to join um, an evangelical church. I'm not sure if it was um, a Brethren or not. And they were a bit surprised because there were no young people in the church. Uh, and I think just before this, my dad had actually, this is interesting in terms of the tent thing, my dad had actually seen a tent being cooked up. And perhaps partly because of his interest uh, from, his, from his father, um, he thought, I'll go along to this meeting. And it was, I think it was the Capel Bible Week uh, for those really old people who might be watching this. I mean, this was before something called Dales, before Downs, before Stonely probably before Spring Harvest, all of these different events that, we, that we've had in the UK. And he went along to this meeting um, and, it, you know, had, um, was first exposed to the Baptist and the Holy Spirit there. Um, and when he went to this local church with my wife, he couldn't understand why everybody in their 20s just weren't there. There was a whole missing group. Um, and he sort of asked around a little bit. And he discovered that as a group, uh, the young people had been asked to leave. And it's like, well, what's going on? Yeah. And it had been because of um, the experience of the Holy Spirit, baptism, Holy Spirit, and um, speaking in tongues, um, that in common with many churches of the time, so we're talking now in the 1970s, um, this whole group had been expelled from the church, said, thank you very much, go somewhere else, please. And so this little group of people um, was a guy called Nigel Ring, um, and uh, he he knew Terry. And at this point, Terry was just a sort of small church pastor in, in a town called Seaford. And he rings up Terry. He says, Terry, will you come and help me? I just don't know what to do. I've got this small group of people and um, we've been kicked out of church. And, and I guess we need to start a church. I mean, it wasn't some kind of great church planting drive. They didn't sort of set out to create a movement. They just wanted to have a, a sense of gathering together and um, and obviously wanted to do things a little bit different. I mean, church was very different in those days to it is now. And I do remember going to some of my uh, extended family's churches and thinking, oh my gosh, this is really dead and boring and dry and nobody's nice to each other afterwards. There was a huge sense of formalism in many churches at the time. You wouldn't certainly were see you, people hugging and part, chatting. Hmm? Were you part of that uh, young group of people who... Well, well, yes, what happened was there. my parents joined it. So, so they were, yeah. when they got to the church, it had already happened. Um, and they somehow got wind of it um, and figured out that there was this group of people. And I think they, that we joined just as they started meeting in a place called um, Clare Hall, it was, in Haywood Heath. And uh, a lot of people think that uh, Church of Christ the King, or as it's now known as Emmanuel Church, or as it was originally known, Clarendon Church in Brighton, was the birthplace of the movement I'm part of called New Frontiers. But in many ways it wasn't, it was Haywards Heath because uh, that was the first church that Terry planted that he wasn't um, the pastor of. So he came in and initially, I think he came in weekly, helped them at the midweek meeting uh, and then helped them to launch a Sunday. And we arrived really as the Sunday was, was being launched. Um, and uh, the year after we arrived, something called Downs Bible Week was launched. And really, that was the birth of, of the New Frontiers movement, although it was called something different in those days. Um, and for those of you who don't know what Car New Frontiers is, it's a sort of charismatic group of churches, uh, but also very much Bible focused. So we would sometimes describe ourselves as reformed charismatic or perhaps just word and spirit or uh, just Bible based, really. And very strong conviction still to the to the Bible. So in that sense, I didn't see the distinction between the brethren roots and we certainly had many brethren people with us um, and certainly some Baptists and some Anglicans, although less Anglicans because we were very much, even in the early days, a, a baptism movement. So, we, you know, we believed in um, either adult or, or at least child, child, older child baptism. I, I remember that was a big issue for me because um, I wanted to be baptised um, and there was a big fight over that. I remember my my parents were like, you're not old enough, you're not old enough. Um, and, uh, and so actually I had an encounter with the Holy Spirit myself. I was at a, a, a meeting, I felt the Spirit poured out into me. I did speak in tongues, uh, and, but more than that, I had a sense of the love of God poured into my heart. And I think I was about eight or nine, something like that. 
And, um, and the verse that then became very precious was where it says in Acts, look, since they have received the Holy Spirit, as we have, what's to stop them being baptized? You know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but you, you know the bit uh, with the Gentiles. And so my parents then allowed me to be baptized, you know, quite young. Um, but sadly at the time, and unfortunately these breaches have since been um, uh, sort of um, very much recovered. But at the time, my extended family were very reluctant to come because, you know, at the time they were like, is this a cult? You know, there's this strange charismatic group that sings choruses instead of good old hymns, although we did sing some hymns. Um, and, and, and are we wacky, you know, a bit weird, a bit kind of happy clappy, swinging from the chandeliers, all those kind of things. Now, as I say, fortunately, in, in more recent years, I think some of the, that division, at least in England, has been, you know, substantially um, healed. And I've actually, you know, subsequently was invited to preach at, at one of the main sort of brethren churches that my extended family were part of. Uh, and that, that, that division is no longer really so relevant in England. I think people are a lot more open to the fact that, yeah, people have slightly different views on the Holy Spirit and gifts, but we're all Christians. We all love God. And hopefully we all we all share the same gospel so yeah so my background really um is that i grew up in a christian home um i did have my own experience uh, of god when i was quite young um i got saved um really when i was about four actually um and um, that was through through asking my parents what on earth it was that we had good friday i mean like what how can it be good they said well jesus died and said well how is that good Surely it should be bad Friday and maybe good Sunday if, if that Sunday Jesus rose again. And my parents yeah. explained the gospel in a very simple way, talked about how, look, you know, if you if you do wrong, then you get punished. And obviously, as a child growing up in the 70s, I knew all about that. Um, let's just say okay. um, and <laughs> things are a bit different now. Um, but um, they said, well, look, you know, either God's going to punish you or God will forgive you. And the only reason he can is because he punished his own son. Um, yeah. so that sort of simple version of penal substitution and I was like okay I, I, I it was put to me as a choice and I remember thinking well why would I choose punishment when I can choose forgiveness and so in that moment um, I, I prayed and the next day I wanted to tell my sister who was two uh, and I remember talking to my other grandfather who was also a believer it was, it was his house we were in actually over Easter uh, when that happened um, and um, he was like no she's too young I said nobody's too young nobody's too young or too old for that matter, uh, to believe in Jesus. So really from quite a young age, I had that kind of evangelistic zeal and I can't pretend that that's always been, um, you know, as much to the fore as it was then, but certainly I guess it's been a, a characteristic of my life that, you know, I have been a gospel person. I have been an evangelical in the sense of, you know, believing yeah. in the good news and believing in that need for people to, to make a crisis response, you know? I mean, I know some people do drift into being a Christian, but ultimately, there is a choice that people have to make. And for me, that was quite yeah. young, obviously then followed up with that baptism experience I was telling about. And by God's grace, I never really look back. I'm not saying I've lived a perfect life. Or, of course I haven't. Um, and there's been times where perhaps I've drifted away a little bit. Um, but in terms of actually turning my back on, on, on God and just wanting to walk my own way, that, that never really happened. I didn't have a rebellious teenage years particularly. What about then um, how your ministry of blogging and vlogging developed from an early stage and maybe you can share some of the key highlights of that you know period of how that ministry has developed and one or two of the people that you've interviewed and how sure. they've impacted you okay so let me just take a step back for a second so i we were in the hayward seath church we then moved to essex and i lost some of that so for a little while i was in a different context although you know by god's grace I, I was asked to do things like preach a little bit, not much, but a little bit as a teenager. So I, I preached a couple of sermons, led the Christian Union. Uh, was Before I led the Christian Union, there was, was a sort of experience of a mini revival. So I grew up very much knowing God and, um, you know, trying to be a sort of brave warrior for God and having a sense that there was some sort of call of God on my life. And at one point I thought maybe I need to go off and be a missionary and, or become a pastor or something. And I even talked about going to Bible school, but um, a great sort of mentor of mine, um, a pastor who I used to go and see, a guy called Eric, who was actually a Pentecostal pastor in Chelmsford at the time, Eric Hutchinson. And he, he said to me, Adrian, look, don't just go to Bible school. You know, you're a bright guy. You're a scientist. You know, you've talked about maybe being a doctor. Go and do that. Um, because he said it's important to have 
sort of life knowledge, life skills before you sort of just drop it all and devote yourself to the church. So he was very much a believer that, you know, we can make a difference in the workplace um, without necessarily being a full time minister. And so um, interestingly for me, as I look back over my life, I've never really had that sense that God wanted me to be full time for him or to work for a church or to have a ministry, but perhaps partly because of that brethren, uh, you know, roots, you know, this belief that you actually can make a difference, even as someone who's not the pastor or even or one of the elders, that there are some things that you can do. You can have a bit of a ministry. So I did a little bit of that as a, as a teenager. Then I went to medical school. Um, and whilst I was at medical school training to be a doctor, there was a season when I didn't do very much. Uh, and then there was a moment um, where there was a guy called Henry Tyler, who was again part of New Frontiers, and he had sort of been discipling me a bit. And there was this one moment where he said to me and a small group of other people that he'd gathered one weekend, he said, look, I believe God's called you to be preachers um, and to sort of declare his word. And uh, it wasn't the first time someone had said that. Um, my grandfather, the one that was a tent preacher, had also said something similar to me. Um, he'd said that, you know, um, I was to carry the word of God, that he was, his time was nearly over, he said to me, um, and I was to carry the word and to preach it faithfully, to declare it faithfully. So I was like, okay. And so I had those, that sort of sense. And also actually, um, I'd been prophesied uh, over by that pastor, the, the guy I mentioned, the Pentecostal pastor. And he'd said, um, you're going to have a ministry that affects thousands. Uh, and yeah. this he said in front of all my um, teenage friends so it was a bit kind of oh my gosh and of course this was before the internet and all the rest of it and so the idea that you know little old me um could have a, a ministry that might affect thousands i just thought i don't i don't see how that works and so for me, for many years actually at, at medical school i'd sort of forgotten about it although i kept reading i read a lot of church history and biographies yeah. and theology um but the idea of me actually being able to do anything it sort of went by the wayside for a little bit i was quite busy with my medicine until this moment when this guy who was my mentor, my discipling guy, said to me, you know, go and pray, God make me a preacher. So I, I did. And um, the, the, literally within three days, the small church I was involved with at the time had asked me to preach and then asked me to coordinate the preaching for a church plant. And it was like, I, you know, I hadn't done it for years, but they sort of wanted me to do that. And they didn't know that I'd had that word. So I started doing that and started to preach there um and for various reasons when we got married we we moved from that church or just before we got married we moved from that church and became part of the church i'm i'm in now um and um again you know right from the moment we started really they were very kind and asked me to get involved a bit with the preaching and helping to lead in various ways i was never an elder there but i was a part of the leadership team for many years and so there was within me there was this sort of hunger to communicate um, some sense that I'd learned something from some of these books I'd read and I was quite inspired by Lloyd-Jones because he was a doctor too um, but I didn't have a, um, a desire to give up my medicine um, and I remember in terms of the blog uh, I had done a couple of odd sort of things online before um, but I suddenly come, came across this blogging when I was actually in the middle of my what was to be my last job in the NHS um, so I was I was working as a psychiatrist um, at a cancer hospital, which is interesting when you think to where I am today. We'll talk about that later, I'm yeah. sure. But, um, and in that cancer hospital, I was seeing patients, you know, um, who were depressed or wanted antidepressants or who were having symptoms uh, related to sort of more psychiatric things. So I was helping there, but I had a bit of time. And I remember one time I was sitting there between patients and I'm like, what is this blogging thing? And um, I think that evening I decided to start one. And initially, honestly, I thought, well, it was a way for me to capture my own ideas. I was a bit disorganized and I was always having thoughts here and thoughts there. So I started just jotting them down and very often quite brief, maybe a quote that I'd read, um, an excerpt from Lloyd-Jones um, or Piper, and, you know, a couple of comments. Um, and um, I, I thought, well, if nothing else, it's something for my kids to read when I'm gone. <laughs> Um, or for just me to sort of gather illustrations from or, you know, little excerpts that I might then use in a sermon. And, you know, when I did preach, I would put my notes up and, um, uh, and then, yeah, I got involved in a few arguments in the early days of blogging. And it's a shame really that this has changed, but in the early days of blogging, there was a lot of interaction between people who had quite different perspectives. And I quite like that. 
um, because we actually were not dealing with straw men. We were actually dealing with real people. And so there would be like debates that went on. There was a, there was a guy called David Wayne, who was a Presbyterian. So that was a shock to me. I mean, I know, you're, you know, Scotland is full of Presbyterians, but um, my, my, most of my Christian friends were all Baptists. And so, you know, to actually meet with a Presbyterian, I think it was the first time I met him, but it was a meeting online. And we used to have a lot of text exchange, but we found actually that there was more, we had more in common than we, than we, uh, that we, than we didn't. So I got involved with discussions with him and some great interactions about the Holy Spirit and, and various other things. In fact, some people thought he was my alter ego, that I'd made him up or he'd made me up and that we, you know, we, were, two, we were the same person. When in actual fact, we weren't. Um, sadly, he, he's you know, gone to be with the Lord now. But um, in those early days, there were lots of people like that. And um, I guess I came to sort of some degree of prominence um, when Steve Chalk um, put out a book, and he wasn't the first person to say this, but he was the first person to popularize it, that yeah. said, um, if you talk about penal substitution or the idea that God punished Jesus, and remember that was how I, I very much got saved, was on that, that context. If you talk yeah. about that, that's cosmic child abuse. Yeah. And I didn't see much response to that online. I mean, there was an awful lot of American bloggers at the time talking about Christian politics and things, what's new. Um, but no one was really responding. I didn't know that some people were writing books in response to that. But in terms of online, there weren't many other people. So I started a series. And I think I gave, you know, a lot of people, I, I, I guess I didn't wear my charismatic hat very strongly in those days online. And so I got quite a following from some reformed people for that. And um, I, would, I would later um, be asked to debate, not Steve, because he was always too, you know, he, he, we, he and I, I'd love to meet him one day, actually, because I'm sure he's got a good heart. But he and I never did a, a debate, as far as I can remember. But I did do a debate with Rob Bell when he sort of came oh. out with saying that hell wasn't real. And so people saw that on The Unbelievable Show. Um, and I appeared on The Unbelievable Show a couple of other times as well. So people started to see me do that. And I also did some interviews. So um, interviewed you know, John Piper at one point, um, uh, which was a real privilege. Uh, you know, um, I interviewed the translators for the ESV when that came out. I did some interviews with them uh, and I got involved in Word Alive when that was launched and uh, was able to interview people like Wayne Grudem. So for a while there, people saw me, you know, as, as the sort of blogger, the interviewer. But what they didn't know was that I still, still was working. Um, I was still working as a doctor. Yeah. Um, part of the reason I had the time was because I stopped working in hospital um, and, um, and was working in pharmaceuticals. So initially that meant great, no on call. So that gave me a little bit of extra time to do the writing because, you know, the, the life of a junior doctor is you, you have to work weekends and nights. So suddenly I didn't have to do that. So I had a bit more time and energy and I, I was quite the dynamo. I didn't have to. Uh, and then a little bit later on, I spent a decade working from home. And during that time, Obviously, I didn't have a commute, um, didn't watch much TV. And so I would furiously write, um, you know, blog posts pretty much every day. Also write the yeah. sermons that I would sometimes preach at Jubilee um, and, and occasionally elsewhere, but mostly at Jubilee um, and get involved in various sort of leadership things there. Um, and obviously have a big, big family. I had five kids. So very busy guy rushing around. Very busy. And then ended up writing two books, uh, Raised with Christ and Hope Reborn, over a um, sort of few year period. So, you know, it was a period of time where I had this huge output. Um, mm -hmm. And then it kind of dropped off um, uh, after that. And we'll perhaps talk a bit more about why. Although initially, I didn't really realise. I got a job back working in the city, so I had to commute. So I suppose if I thought there was anything going on, it was just, oh, I, I've got to commute. But, um, but I, I did sort of dial a lot back. And so a lot of people thought, well, where, where's Adrian gone? Um, you know, I remember this guy that was, you know, all over the internet writing this and that and the next thing. And, and then there wasn't much from me for a while. Yeah. So, um, I mean, we're recording this in the midst of the coronavirus uh, pandemic. And there's a huge amount of anxiety within uh, our communities and society. Uh, and a lot of it relates to maybe those who... Uh, don't keep so well, those who maybe have uh, an immune system that is a bit more uh, weakened through mm. maybe age or a health condition of some kind. And I know that's uh, very much been something of your experience in recent mm. years. Um, 
So can you maybe tell us a bit about uh, your current health and how that, you know, changed for you a few years ago and, and your experience of that? Yeah, so as I say, you know, I had to slow down. Um, I'd stopped doing a lot of my hobbies. You know, I'd stopped preaching. and I'd stopped really blogging pretty much. And if I'm honest, I had felt a bit of a distance from God. I, 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 at the time, if anything, I might have thought I'd backslidden. And perhaps I had. But what was interesting, I think normally if you backslide, you, you lose the love for God and it gets replaced with the love for something else. And, but I didn't really have that. So I, I had a, a distinct lack of passion, a distinct lack of motivation. And I would find that when I got home, I wasn't that interested in the family. And so the family suffered a little bit as well. But I was ma able to do my job, although at times I was struggling a little bit to do my job, which was a new thing for me. You know, this idea of feeling exhausted at the end of the day of just wanting to yeah. watch telly, you know. And so I remember I used, I used to just say, oh, I'm done. I want to just watch some telly and then go to bed, you know. And so suddenly I wasn't writing. Um, my pastor asked me to preach and I was like, Oh, I just don't think I can. And, but yeah. that's a certain amount of looking back at the time. At the time, I just thought, Oh, well, I'm busy, you know? Um, but actually what was happening was my energy levels were gradually going down, but it was building up to a point um, where it would suddenly come to a head. And I would realize that actually something quite serious was going on. I just didn't know it at the time. Um, and it wasn't necessarily purely a spiritual thing, although I'm not disputing that perhaps I could have, pursued God more in those in those times um, uh, but, but I was losing motivation in anything really um, and then one day I was on my way home from work and I, I got off the train um, and as I stepped off the train my legs kind of buckled under me um, yeah. uh, and I couldn't really walk um, I was frightened I was going to fall over I was sort of wobbling in that moment that. sorry in that moment, in that, just in that moment I was very breathless um, and I felt my mind go to cotton wool, which was obviously a scary thought, you know, yeah. really confused and really, really breathless. And I looked at my watch and my pulse was something like 140 or 150, yeah. 144 actually. Yeah. And so I didn't think I should get on the train because I thought I'm going to fall over. So I, I just asked for some help. There was a member of staff on the platform and I sort of sunk into a chair and had to wait for over an hour for the for the ambulance to come because I was still breathing. I think if I'd stopped breathing, they'd have come sooner. But I felt so breathless. I, I, I mean, it was quite a scary time, although I was also sort of drifting a little bit. And it's an interesting thing. I think sometimes when you're really unwell, you, you don't even realize quite how ill you are. Um, so they, they came and they literally carried me um, up the stairs because there was, there was no escalator or whatever. And so they had to take me out on a stretcher, took me to hospital. Uh, I was diagnosed that evening with pneumonia. They said, oh, you're, you know, your white count's high, there's signs on your chest. Uh, and also there was something on the x-ray. Uh, but it didn't look that severe on the x-ray. So they, they said, well, look, we're going to send you home with some antibiotics, but you might need to come back. Uh, and sure enough, I was back into my local hospital a couple of, a, a day or so later, um, even more ill. Um, so the infection sort of really taking hold. Um, so I was in hospital then for about a week or so, and then I was in, I was coming back and forth to hospital daily, being given IV antibiotics, but not really getting any better. And they were a bit puzzled by this. Um, and during that period of time, I was identified as, as having a blood cancer. Um, yeah. so it's a cancer called chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And really from in before you... Early get, days, sorry? In those early days, um, what, what was going through your mind in you know, how you... How emotionally were you responding to your situation? I was a huge yeah. shock. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I, I remember actually, you know, I got the proper diagnosis on, um, on, a, on, a, on a Saturday. I, I actually had to see a private person. It was all a bit confusing because the, the local doctor didn't seem to want to actually, at the hospital that I was under, didn't seem to want to actually um, confirm confirm it I, it was all a bit weird but um so I went to see this private guy and he told us and my wife and I drove home and I'll never forget that moment and then we stopped the car but we didn't we couldn't really talk for very long because we'd left the kids at home and obviously they were in the middle of exams so I didn't want to sort of shock them although I'm sure they were a bit sort of shaken by the fact that their dad was so ill I mean I could barely walk still at this point I was being wheeled around in a wheelchair when I went to the hospital each day to have these injections and um, to try and com combat this infection and and then um, that evening, as soon as my kids went to bed, 
as soon as my wife went to it, because I'd obviously try to keep a lid on it. And I, it's interesting. I think sometimes when you try and push down uh, an emotion, it just comes back even stronger. So as soon as yeah. my wife was asleep, I, I wasn't going to be able to sleep. And uh, it just all came flooding out. I was in floods of tears. I was very mm -hmm. scared. Uh, I was furiously looking on the internet to find out about this thing called chronic lymphocytic leukemia, this blood cancer I had. What did it mean? Uh, it talked about people having a low life expectancy. Some of that data is a little bit out of date now because some people do manage to live for a long time with it. Um, I'd been told this this thing called watch and wait. So although I had cancer in every drop of blood in my body and it spread to all my lymph nodes, although they were all small at that point, that because it was slow growing, I needed to just leave it and do nothing. So that's a weird thing because, you know, you sort of think cancer, let's, let's get rid of it. Um, so I remember in that moment of despair, um, and I, I remember searching online and um, there was a website of a CLL specialist center in London. Uh, and I literally saw in the middle of the night, it said um, there was a nurse led helpline and I'd not had a nurse be able to talk to me. I not had anyone really be able to give me a proper understanding about it. So I was a bit cheeky really, even though I wasn't under their care. And I rang them up and I said, look, can you help me? And, and this lovely nurse with huge amounts of compassion spent about half an hour talking me off the ledge as it were. Uh, and it's amazing, actually, sometimes we, we, we forget that the value of compassion in a moment like that. And, and this guy, I don't think he was a Christian, but uh, he was like an angel to me at that moment. And uh, one of the things he said was, look, you might want to get yourself treated here by a specialist and try and get yourself referred. And sure enough, I managed to do that over the following couple of days. Um, but when I got there, um, I was beginning to go into sepsis. My temperature was like 40 or something and um mm. my immune system had just now had finally woken up it hadn't really done very much but now it's sort of woken up and i i was beginning to sort of go into sepsis and again he really unwell so i got admitted there treated with more aggressive stronger antibiotics um and yeah facing the fact that i could die i suppose although it's a funny thing because mm. it didn't really clock that that was an immediate thing. Although obviously, you know, when you get told you've got cancer, you do tend to think about your own mortality. Um, but I, I guess I wasn't quite so aware, you know, and I guess that's partly the mercy of God in that moment uh, that I could die. Although later on my doctor did so, you do realize, you know, um, that that was a life-threatening infection. Um, and, uh, and he said, and you're gonna have more. So yeah, so really early on, it's like, well, what is going on? My life is on hold. Uh, but you think, oh, it'll, it'll get better, you know, because I was told it was early cancer and that many people wouldn't have very many symptoms at that stage. And I just thought, well, before I got this pneumonia, I was OK. So perhaps I'll be able to sort of get back. And so, you know, whilst I wasn't really blogging much, I mean, that might be the odd thing from that time. Um, I was just trying to get back into work. I mean, it seemed like that was the priority. Uh, perhaps in retrospect, I, I tried too soon. Um, and so for a few months, you know, my my focus really was just in getting through the day even though actually I was mostly working from home um so um not not going out because I couldn't really go out very much still I was still struggling to walk and things and um and struggling to concentrate and my work were bright brilliant but after a few months we realized this just wasn't really working and I needed to go on to sick leave because I'd also had another admission um, it grew in my throat um the tonsils um, met together and I was breathing through a tiny little gap uh, and so I had to have them out as an emergency. And again, that was a shocking sort of experience because I was lying in hospital and a rather uncompassionate doctor. I said, what do you think is going on? And he said, well, I think it's probably an aggressive lymphoma. It's probably transformed. It's probably, you know, gone into something aggressive. And of course, that that can mean a sort of death sentence of, you know, weeks uh, rather yeah. than months or years. Um, as it turned out, it wasn't that. It was still the sort of more slow growing form. Uh, and there are some advantages to having a slow growing form, but there's also some disadvantages, uh, one of which is, as you said, it, it does destroy your immune system. So I, I don't really produce new antibodies. I can apparently produce a few antibodies to things I've already met. But if I was to meet the coronavirus or anything else that I've not met, I, I wouldn't really be particularly good at producing new antibodies. And my immune system in general doesn't work terribly well. So I'm on antibiotics to keep to try and keep um, illnesses at bay all the time. Um, I've had to sort of self-isolate to a greater or lesser extent. And obviously you can't just live in your bedroom uh, all the time, but you know, had mm -hmm. to sort of think about risk assessment, about what sort of situations am I prepared to go into? You know, uh, should I avoid crowds? Should I keep my distance? I mean, these things that people are talking about, are like keeping two or three 
feet, two or three meters away from people. It's something that's been in my mind for a while. So suddenly people are, are worrying about washing their hands. I've been very careful about that for quite a while. Um, not using the same towel as someone else in your family, but drying your hands on kitchen roll and then not immediately contaminating your hand by using the door handle. So you might like, you know, mm-hmm. pluck a sleeve and use the sleeve and, you know, being very conscious and alert, uh, you know, um, that if I go to a church meeting and I sit next to someone and they're coughing, um, that that could mean hospital for me or perhaps even worse, you know? Um, so actually it's an interesting thing for me right now because the anxiety that many people are suddenly feeling now I've been living with for sort of two or three years now, really. Yeah. So you really have been through quite a a difficult period over these last few years. Um, Yeah. You know, many people may not have been aware of that. And, um, you know, if I'm honest, looking at you on uh, online today, you actually visibly look very well. Um, and that must be quite frustrating for you. In a <laughs> sense. Uh, you know, well, I suppose it's there. better than looking ill. I mean, you know, like yes, but- one time I walked into my GP and my face was grey. Um, yeah. and I could I was sort of shuffling in I looked like an old man and this was quite early on that was what really led her to getting me to the specialist hospital because I looked like I was you know dead man walking really so yeah, yeah so it's one of the things I mean you have to sort of work with yourself because actually when someone says oh you look great isn't it wonderful praise the lord you're cured and in the meantime yeah. you've actually really struggled to get to church that day for example oh, right. um, and you nearly fell over on the way in and you know, and, and all you want to do is get home because you're exhausted and perhaps you fell asleep during the sermon. Um, and so you're feeling guilty about that. You weren't able to stand up during the worship. But, you know, I've always been a chatty, chirpy chappy, you know. Um, and, and it's not all fake because you do, it's not like you're in misery all the time. And you do have a certain amount of energy. So for me, you know, I can still chat and look relatively normal these days for maybe an hour, two hours, something like that. Um, whereas before I could do that all day um now you know once once i've been chatting for a while you know I'll, I'll be pretty exhausted so you know perhaps after this interview you know whereas before i might have then you know written a blog post or a sermon or something or you know written some of my book or something like that you know or wanted to talk to other people on the phone or bother people basically um i'm much more likely now to want to just go and lie on my couch and have a snooze yeah. or, or maybe watch yeah. some silly tv program and, and and i need to rest um so that so there's the two things really that are still there because i've had the chemotherapy and um it's in check but they've said it's not cured and in their view it will come back at some point but it might even be years yeah. before that happens um so the actual cells themselves are well under control uh, they did a bone marrow biopsy, and less than one in a hundred thousand of my bone marrow cells are now cancerous, whereas before it would have been a lot, lot more than that. Um, but the damage to my immune system has been done, um, and so I, I and that I'll probably live with all my life. Um, so I'm very, very susceptible to infection, um, mm. but also uh, the fatigue that comes with that is a little bit like I think what people who have chronic fatigue syndrome experience. But it's very, yeah. very common um, for cancer patients. Uh, particularly if they've been treated or particularly actually if they've had blood cancers um even if they've not been treated or even if they've been treated and in theory they're quote quote better actually to sort of struggle with what i describe as a sort of crushing fatigue i mean uh, i'm not the only person to describe it this way but um for anyone who wants to sort of try and get your head around it the the only thing i remember that's even vaguely similar to it is how you feel when you've got a flu i think we've all had flu at various points in our lives and when you've got the flu, you just don't want to get out of bed. Your arms and legs maybe feel achy, and, and mine do most of the time. They feel weak. Um, they feel heavy. Uh, and your whole body, your whole brain is telling you, just rest. It's a sort of, you know, I suppose it's a survival thing. Find somewhere safe and warm. Tuck yourself up away from the predators <laughs> of the world, yeah. you know, and work and all the rest of it, and yeah. just rest yeah. and get better. And so that's the impulse that's in my my mind all day every day i mean early on when i was recovering from the pneumonia someone said just just listen to your body and and you'll know what to do and what not to do but but honestly if i did do that i'd I'd never get out of bed um so in the same way that you know if a smoke detector went off at home when you had the flu you would be able to physically get up and walk out and save yourself Uh, it's a little bit like that for me i have to sort of force myself uh, almost whip myself you know to get going and do things um and then, but really, you know, 
when I am up and about. I don't do much in the way of walking. I certainly can't stand for very long. That's one of the weird things, actually. Standing's even worse than walking for some reason. Mm -hmm. My legs get quite weak. Um, and mentally and emotionally, I've got much less capacity than I used to have. And so, yeah, I'm just like, when can I get back to bed, basically, is, is what's in my mind sometimes. I guess there's, ha there's had to be a, such a big shift, hasn't there, in terms of your daily activities uh, and to take on board the reality of, of your current sort of... Yeah, uh, so I haven't worked for more than two years, not even one day for example, yeah. um, in terms of paid work. Um, blogging happens occasionally, but it's really hard. I find it much harder to write than I used to, where I could bang something off in half an hour. Um, that might take multiple hours, and I might have to do it in several sittings as well. I might not be able to focus my mind and, and you know write something down. But, but I do find it a blessing to still be able to do that a little bit. Uh, and yeah. so I have sort of wrestled with some of these thoughts and suffering. I've read Tim Keller's book, and I've been blogging a little bit about some of the ideas I've learned from there. On, on it's called Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering. And then just recently, um, we had we were blessed to have R.T. Kendall with us on the past Sunday, and it was interesting because I, I struggled out to church on Sunday. I don't always make it, but I made it this Sunday. I, I actually had a really bad back because I'd fallen over like some old man. I mean, it's you know I feel like I'm 90 before my time, and I'd had a fall, you know, and um, and I've bruised my back, still quite sore. But I, I went to church on Sunday, and I sat there not sure even then it, how many more times i'd be able to go because of this whole coronavirus thing until it settles and um yeah. and of course you know in the week there's been comments about people with my kind of condition already really needing to isolate ourselves and so i was there for what i thought might be the last time for a while um and there was rt kendall and um he began his preach by saying look there's probably at least one person here and you're going through the worst time of of trial or suffering in your life um and, and i'm here to talk to you and i thought wow well that's me yeah that's me for the last three years uh, that's definitely me uh, although it's interesting because of course it's not that i've never suffered before and i think I, but i do think that when whatever it is you're facing at that moment it might be to someone else they might think oh that's just small um or even for me you know you might look at my situation and honestly compared to what some people have to face my situation is quite small you know i i am able to you know um clean myself you know which at one point I couldn't so that's something I'm grateful for I'm able to potter around the house a little bit um maybe even have a short walk you know um I'm able to cook I tend to be sitting down when I do that you know and there are things that I can do and there are many people that can't do any of that you know um yeah. and I have some pain um on a day-to-day -day basis um but many people have much worse pain than, than I'm experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis I remember talking to a guy who had ankylizing spondylitis and somehow managed to be a pastor from his wheelchair and he mm. said that the pain he had every morning um when he was being washed and dressed by his wife he couldn't do any of that himself um was so bad that when he went to a dentist and they wanted to do a filling he always told the dentist don't, don't bother there's no point in you injecting me because the pain as you drill is nothing compared to the pain i have every day so don't worry about it it's, it's fine it's just like a little scratch mm. you know um, compared to what he was experienced. So there's always, as I say, a bigger fish, uh, to use the Star Wars illustration, you know. And there's always someone else that's had a worse problem than you. There's always someone else who's, who's had a less problem than you. But actually for the individual, when you as an individual yeah. are facing the worst thing you've ever faced, there, then, then that can be quite, yeah, quite the moment. Yeah. So how would you say these last few years have maybe changed the way you think about God and relate to God um, has has there been a shift of any kind yeah no definitely I mean I think I had sort of to a certain extent bought into the idea that, that God will look after you know I wasn't a health wealth and prosperity man and I would have been quite clear that I wasn't but I think many of us feel like we've done a bit of a deal with God you know so if I go to church um, if I sort of have some sort of ministry, whatever that might be, whether it's um, preaching, teaching, leading a small group, even helping teas and coffees or serving in a food bank or whatever, whatever it might be that I'm doing. And, and if I'm giving money to the church and I'm at least trying not to, you know, commit the most egreg egregious sins, you know, I, I, I'm sleeping in the right bed and, um, and all these sorts of things. Um, 
you know, not not a drunkard or not not these dramatic sins. I mean, we all commit sin, but you know, we sort of think, well, if I'm if I'm doing these things, um, then God yeah. kind of owes me, and He'll bless me and He'll keep me safe, and everything's going to be all right, you know. Um, and you have that sense of security, really. Um, that I would argue is a form of blindness, actually, because um, one of the things that you realise um, is none of us have that security really and i guess the coronavirus is making that clear to so many people it's almost like a, a veil is being lifted and we're suddenly thinking oh my gosh whereas the truth is you know many people die in a road traffic accident but we don't think of that from day to day um we don't think of our risk of having say a heart attack i mean i'm in i'm almost 50 now you know i'm in that bucket and you know we don't tend to sort of appreciate i mean there was a woman who I think uh, either just before I got this illness or maybe just after, I can't remember, in our church, young, fit, healthy woman who just one day, one weekend, had a brain bleed and died over the weekend, you know? Mm. And um, so none of us are as secure as we like to think we are. Uh, and one of the things I often say to people when they've just been diagnosed with cancer and, and suddenly it's their world is full of it and they're just like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. Uh, is actually, especially if you've got one of these more chronic, sort of slower growing cancers, that the sad reality is there's probably a loved one of yours or friend or family member who will die before you, who right now you think is fit and healthy. So none of us can guarantee tomorrow. Uh, we've only got today. And so, you know, I, I'm a lot more today focused than I used to be. Um, and uh, with the limited energy I have, I try and say, well, OK, what is it God wants me to do today? whether that's helping a family member at home, um, just cooking or clearing up or trying to be a kind dad rather than a frustrated dad. And that's not always easy when you're tired. Sometimes you can feel ratty, let's be honest. Um, but just those daily attempts at least to, 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 to sort of be a better person uh, and to be a positive impact and maybe to help somebody a little bit in some small article I write or some small interaction I have with somebody. It's like much more focused on the little things um rather than the sort of the big things or writing a new book or something sorry if you take a scripture link in psalm 23 uh, the lord is my shepherd i shall not want he makes me lie down in green pastures now how would you read a scripture like that you know, bearing in mind all that you've been through over these last few years has it has it actually change the way you would read a scripture like that um yeah i guess i go straight to the next bit where it says even though i walk through the valley of the shadow of death you are with me and so yeah. you know i think um perhaps before i'm i would maybe have thought oh, everything's fine everything will be fine and not really realized that well jesus promised and i, I mentioned henry tyler earlier not one of my mentors and uh, he 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 used to love quoting um, the words of Jesus where he said look in this world you will have troubles and mm. he used to cheekily say look how many of you know Jesus always keeps his promises you know yeah. and actually I don't hear many people naming and claiming that one and <laughs> one of the things R.T. Kent yeah. said is like, we're not saying you should go and pray God give me a trial give me a suffering I mean actually you know the Lord's Prayer uh, which incidentally for those of you who are washing your hands um, you can actually uh, do it to the Lord's Prayer if you want, instead of happy birthday, because that's about 20 seconds as well. So, you know, you could revolutionize your prayer life by uh, every time you wash your hands saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be, and all that. Um, um, but one of the things it says in there, and I remember thinking that just this morning, actually, as I was washing my hands doing exactly that, it says, to, you know, lead us not into temptation. And that word temptation there is, is also trial. It's the same word. It's a sort of yeah. testing. So there is a sense in which when you when you go through something like this it is a time of testing and your faith does get tested and sometimes to be honest you feel like your faith might disappear uh and you can become almost quite lacking in hope but somehow there's a journey there's a battle um and and you cling on to god and you do you, you like become more desperate your prayers become help me god help me to get through the next hour the next day um rather than necessarily the sort of the longer term um, but as I say, I wouldn't recommend anyone sort of asks for trial, quite the opposite, you know, ask mm. to be released from it. But if God, uh, in his um, sovereignty and wisdom, you know, decides to entrust you with a trial, um, you do have to realize that he's leading you. That Yes, there are times when he leads you through green pastures, but there are also times where he leads you through the shadow of death. 
Um, and That's some of the challenges in that moment is to feel the presence of God. And there are moments actually um, where both can be true, you know, where you can actually say, actually, you know what, God is with me. And one of the most important things in that is, is looking for marks of grace and, and knowing what to be grateful for. Mm-hmm. So, so just simple things like, you know, being able to sleep in your own bed rather than hospital bed is, is a wonderful thing. And I'm, I, I remember being so grateful to God when I was discharged each time I've yeah. been discharged because I've had several admissions or being grateful. I made it, made it through a whole year without sleeping a night in hospital last year, which was wonderful. Even though I was having chemotherapy. Um, yeah. you know, I never actually needed to sleep a night in hospital for the whole of 2019 and so far 2020 as well, which is great because 2018 and 2017, I think I spent around about a month of each of those two years in total, or maybe a bit more actually um, in a hospital bed. So, you know, there's something quite, yeah, it's not great being in a hospital bed, let's be honest. Um, yeah. and so it's great to sleep in your own bed. And you, you become grateful and you thank God for things, uh, yeah. whatever they, those things are. And that, that makes a huge difference, really. What, what would you say has maybe helped you at your lowest points uh, in terms of refocusing and moving forward? Okay, well, I think um, there's sometimes you just need to be able to talk to somebody. That's one thing. Yeah. Um, whether it was just talking to that nurse, for example, on, on, on that first night, you know, when I diagnosed that day, uh, whether it's talking to counsellors. I, I, I mean, I've, I've gone to see secular counsellors and just the ability to talk about it can really help. Yeah. I've phoned helplines. Um, but also, obviously, prayer. And within prayer, actually, prayer can be difficult. Sometimes it can almost feel harder being a Christian facing this than if you're not, at least at some stages, because you've got all these questions, you know, about how is God allowing this to happen and why me? But then after a while, it's like, well, why not me? I mean, we live in a fallen world. Someone, it's going to happen to someone, so why shouldn't it be you? Um, there's that. And then there's this sort of somehow pressing through with God, and um, it can be really hard to connect with God in those moments. So one of the things I found helpful is listening to certain sorts of worship music, but I'll be honest, I found some worship songs really frustrating. You know, the sort of yeah. more celebratory ones, you know, the loud, glary yeah. sort of songs. I, I was like, I don't want to listen to that. So I created a playlist of sort of slightly slower songs, more thoughtful mm-hmm. songs, songs which were often written out of other people's pain or inspired by some of the Psalms, because we see that in the Psalms where, you know, David says some shocking things to God, like, you know, why? Why is this happening? Why have you forsaken me? Where are you? what's going on you know you're, you're yeah. away from me you you're distant you know and and many people today would say well you can't say that to god well you can say that to god but sometimes you can't find the words and so a psalm or, or a song that's been written perhaps inspired by a psalm or inspired by someone's situation and a song that takes you back to the gospel because ultimately the big question you have to ask yourself is do you really believe it and so it was a really weird thing for me i mean am i am i really a christian you know, am I really ready to face God? Um, you know, and you look at your life and suddenly you feel convicted of sin, of things that you've done and still doing. So I'm, I'm not the father I should be. I'm not the husband I should be. I'm not the friend I should be. There are friends I've let down. And you have a lot of time to reflect and ruminate and, and have regrets mm-hmm. as well. Um, and so one of the things I did, believe it or not, was picked up my, my, my own book, uh, which I wrote together with Toppy, my pastor, a book called Hope Reborn. And it's a summary of the gospel. Uh, and I read it through my kind of fuzzy brain um, as mm. though it, I'd never read it before, even though I very much helped to write it. Um, and as though I'd never heard the gospel before. I was like kind of clinging onto it, like almost like I was a drowning man looking for something to hold onto, a life raft. And it very much becomes the life raft that, that you do believe that, you know, our hope is not mm. just for this world, but it's for a future that even if I do die, um i'll be with god forever um and that actually god is with me and that there are certain things that they you know that shows that god's sovereignty so for example for me I, I have been looked after financially we have had quite a big drop in salary but um the amazing thing is um just just weeks really before i got sick i joined a company that had a very very generous sick pay policy through through an insurance policy so it's an insurance back scheme that means that I'm actually paid, um, you know, a significant portion of, of what was my salary uh, for doing yeah. nothing. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm very blessed like that. I can, I can sit yeah. around focusing on my recovery, um, 
and um, you know without having to worry about money to that extent although obviously there has been a drop in pay and I mean my wife's had to work in order to help to cover that and I'm grateful to her for doing that. Um, As we bring this interview to a close maybe, maybe someone watching this is facing what they would describe as the greatest trial of their life yeah. and uh, maybe in closing Adrian I could ask you to pray briefly uh, for anyone uh, who is watching uh, sure. that would be great yeah father god I, I do thank you that your hand is with us uh, that you are sovereign that we don't live in a universe that's governed purely by chance and that whilst uh, you, you you obviously feel our pain when we're facing these difficult situations and just as you wept when your friend died and you saw the pain of his fan family as they were also grieving and your heart was moved that your heart is moved towards anyone watching this saying yeah I get it Adrian that's that's you know maybe a different circumstance but I too am facing the worst trial I've ever experienced and I pray for anyone who's in that position that you will just draw close to them that they will find that way to connect with you that they'll be able to access materials or resources that help them um, there are sermons that you can watch, books that you can read, but I pray more than all of that, that they would know your presence and your love uh, with them, um, guiding them and healing them, I pray. Amen. Amen. Great. Well, you've made it to the end of an episode of Adrian Warnock's Christian Podcast. You must have some stamina. Well done. And if you liked what you heard, you know what to do. Subscribe, review, tell all your friends about it. And in the meantime, why not visit adrianwarnock.com.